Welcome to our broadcast from the Church of the Resurrection in Crosby, Texas. Today's message is brought to you by Father Rusty Elliser, Senior Pastor of the Church. Before we begin, invite your family and friends to gather around the screen as we watch and hear the sermon from God's servant. And now as we join the congregation in the name of the church, we pray you will open your mind, your ears, and your heart to receive the word of God. So as I said to y'all in the email this week, uh, we're nearing the end of the church year. And so after today, we only have uh, two more Sundays before the beginning of Advent, believe it or not. Um, every few years, I try to take, um, sometimes it's been as many as uh, four or five Sundays, but try to remind us of the basics of what we want to, to be and do as a church. And so this year, I can't remember if I did it last year or not, but this year I want to try to do it in two Sundays. And so um, this Sunday, we're going to look at the story that we tell as the church, the story we believe and celebrate. And then with God's help, next week, we'll consider the life of the church. And, and I'm going to give you uh, some really short phrases next week that I think will be helpful for us to remember things we want to do. And it'll be very practical next week. You know, if you're the type of person that wants to know, OK, what do I do? Come back next week. I'll tell you just what to do. Um, but. Um, I'd like to, to tell again the story today. I think it's one of the most exciting things that's um, starting to be stressed probably in the last, I don't know, several decades in the church is this recovery of the story and how it all flows together. Um, and so I'd like to try to present it in a way that you can remember. I think I understand it a little better now than I did five or 10 years ago. Um, but I wanna try to give it to you in a way that you'll be able to wrap your minds around it and, um, and think through it and tell it. So if you can remember uh, four names, you can remember the whole story. There's a lot of important people in the Bible, but pretty much all of them come below um, one of these names. So the four names I want you to remember are God, Adam, Abraham, and Jesus. Let me say those one more time and you can repeat after me. God, Adam, Abraham, Jesus. Together, God, Adam, Abraham, Jesus. There you go, you got it. So here's the short version and then we'll unfold it a little bit and, um, and then bring it to a conclusion. So this is what happened. God created, created Adam, gave him and his wife Eve the responsibility of reigning over and developing the earth. When Adam failed and brought disaster to humanity and the world, God called Abraham so that through his people, God could fix the mess. When Abraham's people called Israel now were failing, God sent his son, Jesus, the Messiah, and through Jesus, God accomplished his plan to save and renew his creation, humanity and the world. So that's it. God, Adam, Abraham, Jesus. Let us stand and confess our faith in the word of the Nicene Creed. That's the sermon's over. Now let's try to unfold the story a little bit and think through it. Um, so first of all, God. When we turn to the first pages of Genesis, we jump right into the story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and what a heaven and an earth God created. Just looking at creation tells us something about the glory and the wonder of God. You know, go to the zoo and walk around and look at all the animals. Go walk through a beautiful garden and look at the flowers. Stand before the mountains, watch the sunset, you know, what kind of being must God be to have thought up and designed all of that and kept it working? But then maybe the greatest wonder of all, after God made it all, he made us lowly human beings and he placed us in charge of all of it, right? He placed us in charge of all this beauty, all of this creation. And then we come to Adam. God instructed our first parents to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. They were to be the living images of God throughout the world, to reign over the earth and to use its resources. So humanity was eventually to um, build grand cities, design beautiful parks and gardens, compo compose glorious symphonies, make food like gumbo. I mean, you know, all of that. We were gonna come up with 
and develop. We were supposed to make the world a place that would reflect the glory of God. And we were to do all of that in communion with God. In the beginning, God would come down and walk with Adam and Eve in the garden. Can you imagine that? Imagine just strolling along with God and talking about all the stuff you'd done that day and all the plans you had to do the things he wanted you to do. But you know the story, that did not last. Eve was deceived. She and Adam wanted to be like God, to define good and evil for themselves. And so the results of that were disastrous. We still see them today. Their relationship with God was broken. Their relationship with each other was broken. They had to leave that garden where they had walked with God. The earth began to grow thorns and thistles and work became a burden. And sin began to bear its fruit in their bodies and in the world and its final wages would be death. So at this point, what was God to do? Would he just leave human beings and creation to simply die and rot away and that would be the end of the story? That wouldn't be like God, as one early Christian said. <clears throat> but no one probably would have imagined what God would choose to do. He looked down from heaven and from the whole world of people, he chose one senior citizen, a man named Abram. And that old man and his elderly wife, Sarai, had no children. But God promised him that a whole nation of people would come from him. God promised to make his name great. God would give his people a beautiful land to live in. He would bless them. He would curse their enemies. And in that people, all the families of the earth would be blessed. In other words, they would be the means by which God's blessing would flow back out into the world. So God's plan was that ultimately, through the people who would come from Abraham, as the Bible puts it, through Abraham's seed, God would somehow deal with this mess of sin and death. He would breathe his spirit of life back into his people. And human beings would once again know God and serve him and reign on the earth just like God intended from the beginning. Now, what a plan that was and what a high calling for the family of Abram. And so it began. Abram believed God. He believed these promises. He left his home, journeying toward this land that God would give him. Abram was renamed Abraham, and his wife was renamed Sarah. And guess what? They had a baby at an old, old age, and they were fruitful and multiplied. It looked like this. They had a son who had a son who had 12 sons who had more children, and they eventually grew into a great nation, the nation called Israel. And God made an agreement or a covenant with Israel. He promised to be their God and they promised to be his people. They kind of took their wedding vows in a sense. Eventually God brought them to the land that he had promised to Abraham and God blessed them just as he promised he would. And the vast majority of our Bible tells about God's dealings with this people, the people called Israel. But alas, it was a rough marriage. God was always a faithful husband, but Israel was frequently an unfaithful wife. Why was that? Because they had the same disease that the rest of humanity had. They were infected with sin. And as sin worked in them, they constantly turned away from God. They didn't live faithfully with God and they didn't live faithfully with each other. They worshiped other gods, they lied, they cheated, they stole, they committed adultery. Think about the words from the prophet Amos this morning, where God said to his people, imagine this, God said to his people, I hate your worship. I won't accept your offerings. Quit singing your songs. What I want to see from you is a people who practice justice and righteousness. Things eventually got so bad that God gave his people over to a fierce nation called Babylon, and the Babylonians destroyed their temple, the house of their God. They destroyed their capital city and took most of the people far away from that beautiful land into exile. 
But Israel's prophets told of a day when God would forgive the sins of his people and welcome them back home. And they would know God. They would have their hearts renewed and they would walk in his ways and be filled with joy and peace. And God would raise up a faithful king to reign over them. But not just to reign over them. But the prophet said, all nations would come to Jerusalem and submit to their king and worship their God and learn to walk in his ways. And blessing and righteousness and peace would flow out from Zion. The nations would actually stop going to war with each other and live in peace. And even the animals would stop eating each other and they would live in harmony and all the creation would be made new. Well, after about 70 years, God let his people come back to their land. They rebuilt their temple, they rebuilt their city, but weeks turned into years, years into decades, decades into centuries, and all the things the prophets had promised didn't happen. There were some ups and downs, but mostly downs. The people were still infected by sin. Israel was still corrupt. They were still unfaithful. So you can see the problem at this point in the story. God could not bless the world through this people. Because of their disobedience, they were under a curse. It didn't seem like God's plan was going to work. How could the world be blessed through the seed of Abraham? The plan was just stuck. So what was God to do? Almost 2,000 years after God made his great promises to Abraham, about four centuries after the Jews had come back to their land from Babylon, a Jewish man and his young fiance traveled to Bethlehem. The young lady was pregnant, but she had never been with a man. She was a virgin. The baby that had been conceived in her was conceived by the Holy Spirit of God. And while this couple was in Bethlehem, the time came for the lady to have her baby. She gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger. The man's name was Joseph, the woman was Mary, and they named the baby Jesus. It was through Mary that the Son of God became a man. And he was born into the same sinful flesh that we all have, but he never sinned. And so in Jesus, we find a man, we find an Israelite, who was faithful to God, the only one. Jesus knew God. He trusted in his Father. He delighted to obey his Father. And he announced to Israel that he was bringing the kingdom of God. All the stuff they'd been waiting for. The time when God would once again be king and his people would once again know him and serve him in righteousness and joy and peace. And he performed signs to show them that all this was true. And so he healed sick people, a lot of them. He restored sight to the blind. He cast out demons. He even raised people from the dead. And through his words and through his very self, Jesus revealed to people what God is really like and what Israel was called to be as his son. So Jesus preached this good news, but he also gave a warning. He warned his fellow Jews that if they refused him, the judgment of God was coming soon. And just as in the days of Amos, the day of the Lord would be darkness for them and not light. In the days of Amos, the judgment of God had come through the ruthless empire of Assyria. Later, as we said, that judgment came through the Babylonians. The judgment of which Jesus warned was going to come through the Romans. But in spite of all this, and even because of a lot of this, the majority of the leaders in Israel rejected Jesus. They plotted against him. They finally handed him over to the Roman leader Pontius Pilate and managed to manipulate the situation until Pilate finally handed Jesus over to be crucified. And so Jesus died on the cross. But as terrible as that was, it all happened exactly according to the plan of God. Jesus himself had said that he had come to give his life as a ransom for many. In other words, he would save his people by dying for them. 
Now, this is where I want you to stay tuned in to the history. In his death, Jesus suffered the curse that Israel was under. So his death was an atonement for their sins. Because of his death, God could forgive their sins. Now, because Jesus had been faithful and obedient, three days after he was executed, God raised him up from the dead, effectively reversing the sentence that the Romans and Jews had pronounced upon him. They had said, he is guilty. God raised him saying, no, he is righteous. Forty days later, God took Jesus into heaven and Jesus sat down on the throne to begin to reign. Ten days after that, God poured out his spirit on those who had believed in Jesus and they began to tell their fellow Jews that Jesus had indeed been the Messiah, that he had redeemed them from the curse of the law, that now God had forgiven their sins and through him they could receive the Holy Spirit of new life. And a lot of the Jews believed that good news and they were baptized in the name of Jesus and they received the new life of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the words of the prophets began to come true. But some of them still refused. And what happened to them? Well, that is a dark, dark story. Because only a few decades later, Jesus' words about them happened. They were fulfilled. They went to war with Rome. You can read about it in the history books. The Romans defeated them in a dreadful war. The historians tell us, tell us that the Romans crucified thousands of Jews. In fact, it says the Romans eventually ran out of wood to crucify them. It was that bad. And Jesus had said it would be that bad. But notice this. Those Jews suffered the exact fate, exact fate, that Jesus had died to save them from. He had died on the cross so that they wouldn't have to. But those who rejected him, many of them died on crosses. But those Jews who had believed in Jesus, they didn't go to war. And so they were brought safely through that judgment and out the other side. But what is the rest of the story? We're nearing the end here. The death and resurrection of Jesus was good news for Israel, but it wasn't just good news for only Israel. Remember God promised Abraham that through him all the families of the earth would be blessed. And so once the curse on Israel had been dealt with, this meant that God's plan could finally move forward. It was kind of like a river that had been clogged up. And once the obstruction was removed, now the waters could go gushing through and flow freely. So Jesus himself was that seed of Abraham who suffered the curse so that through him, the living water could now flow back out to all people. And so very early on, Jesus' apostles began to tell the story about him to people who were not Jews. <clears throat> they told those people that there was one God, the Creator, that His plan had been accomplished in Jesus, the Messiah, and God had made Him King of all nations, and through Him and His death and resurrection, they too could receive the forgiveness of their sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And many of these people that were not Jews believed this good news, and they were baptized, and they began to meet together to read the scriptures, to pray, to sing praises to the God of Abraham right alongside their Jewish brothers and sisters. Jesus had given his followers a special meal to celebrate in remembrance of him and eating that meal would be the means by which they would remember his sacrifice and receive the forgiveness of their sins and be filled with the new life of God. And so they ate that meal together each week and it not only created communion with God, it created communion with each other. It bound them together as a family. And so they lived life together as a family. They helped each other. They, they laughed together. They cried together. And wherever the gospel went, this story about Jesus, these little communities would spring up and be formed. Now here's a bunch of history in a few sentences. Early on, this good news made it to an island off the coast of Europe which eventually would be called Angle Land. The branch of that church that came through, the branch of the church rather, that came through that island would be called Anglican 
And it spread to many places in the world, eventually to the colonies in America, and eventually to Crosby, Texas. That's not in the Bible. That's just how the story goes. And so here we are, guys. Here we are. Being formed into the people of God. Living this life of worship, community, and mission that you'll hear more about next week. And waiting. Waiting for the end of the story. Which in many ways will be the beginning of the story. When God will appear. He will raise all people from the dead. And judge the world through the King Jesus. Those who have ultimately refused him and not wanted to live in his kingdom, God will grant their wish. They will go off to eternal death. But all of us who have believed him will have our bodies transformed without any trace of sin or any worry of death. And God himself will come to earth to live with us in an even more intimate way than he was with Adam and Eve. God will wipe away the tears from your eyes from our faces and he will make everything new we will serve him and reign on the earth forever just as he intended from the beginning amen Thank you for watching the broadcast today. We hope you will visit the campus of the Church of the Resurrection and take advantage of the many ministries available to you and your family. Until next week, may God richly bless you and keep you.